Friends, what is love? Isn't that an important question? What is love? It's such a central theme in the Bible. So what comes to your mind when you hear the words, what is love? If you're pious, you're probably thinking, God is love. If you're not so pious, you're probably thinking, baby, don't hurt me, right? <laughs> Which one? Which one did you think about? Well, both are true, aren't they? God is love. So if you want to know love, you must know God. But love is something that makes us very vulnerable. It's something that could hurt. It's something that could cause turmoil within us. But what about God? Can love cause turmoil within God's heart? You see, love is risky for us, right? We, we give of ourselves when we love. Love makes us vulnerable. But can God be vulnerable? Can God be at a risky situation? Well, we have to be careful as we think about this because our, our finite mi minds are trying to understand the infinite God. But there is a sense in which God is deeply invested in his relationship with those who are his. There is a sense in which God is totally given to those whom he loves. I think we're going to see that today in our passage. Although the book of Hosea is filled with judgment, there is a deep, personal, and transformative love in God that shines occasionally in this book. Kind of like Bright stars on a dark, cloudless night. But before we go on, let's just review a little bit of where, where we are and how we got here. Hosea was a prophet to the northern kingdom of Israel. Throughout the book, we see this kingdom referred to as Israel, the kingdom. Sometimes we hear... This kingdom referred to as Ephraim. Ephraim is simply the largest tribe in the kingdom of Israel. Sometimes we hear the word Samaria. Samaria is the capital of Ephraim. We see also references to the kingdom of Judah, which is the southern kingdom of Israel. And we hear references to even the faithfulness of Judah. Jesus came from Judah. Hosea is a part of, of a group of books from the Bible called the Minor Prophets, sometimes called the Book of the Twelve. They're not minor in importance. They are simply shorter books compared to the major prophets like Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. One verse that really helps us, so I talked about this about a month ago, one verse that really helps us understand the whole book of Hosea is Hosea 1, verse 2. And here's what it says. When the Lord first spoke through Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, Go, take to yourself a wife of whoredom, and have children of whoredom. So chapters 1, 2, and 3 in the book of Hosea are about Hosea's personal life. His relationship with this unfaithful wife called Gomer. You see, Hosea stands as the faithful one pursuing the unfaithful. Chapter 4 on, God takes this real life illustration and applies it to his relationship with his people. You see, the people of God are depicted in this book as an unfaithful wife pursued by a faithful God. Before Easter, Pastor Andrew walks us, walked us through, through chapters 8, 9, and 10, and we saw great judgments being displayed. Relentless judgments because Israel 
had pursued false gods. Israel had pursued idols. We saw very little promise. But today, as we turn to chapter 11, there is a turn in the book. We see more promise. We see more hope. Although the message still is judgment. We're going to see today the tender heart of God. Our illustration shifts. God is no longer speaking to his people as a husband pursuing an unfaithful wife. But now God speaks to his people as a father pursuing a rebellious child. My goal for today is this, and with this I'm going to give you my outline. Today, I want to help us grow in the understanding that God is indeed good, always, in his love, that's easy to see, right? In his justice, and also in his judgment. This is my outline. Chapter 11, we're going to see the love of God. Chapter 12, we're going to see the justice of God. And in chapter 13, we're going to see the judgment of God. I will go through the whole text, okay? I have a clock in front of me, and I'm aware of it. Some of you think it perhaps should be a calendar instead of a clock to keep track of the days. No, the clock is fine. We're going to go through the whole, through, through all the chapters. I will not emphasize every verse equally. Not all verses are created equal, right? Well, they're all inspired, but some of them are going to function better for our instruction today than others. So let's start considering the love of God in chapter 11. Look at verse 1. When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. What's well, like God is reminiscing, right? He's, he's nostalgic. His love towards a tender child. Like a father who thinks of his son when he is young. It's hard to think of a sweeter, sweeter thing or a sweeter thing than a young and tender and apparently innocent child, right? I, I'm not one to look at old pictures a lot, but in the past few months, I've been flipping through my phone to look at old pictures quite a bit because there's something really sweet in considering a tender child. God is thinking of the times in which his people first came to be, the times in the land of Egypt and that child he loved. And because he loved that child, he called that child. Called from what? Called to what? God called that child out of slavery, out of bondage to himself, to his promises. This is referring to, referring, referring to the time of the Exodus when Israel was young and in need of Rescue. Look at Exodus 4, 22, 23. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son. And I say to you, let my son go that, we may, that he may serve me. If you receive to let him go, behold, I will kill your firstborn son. So just as Pharaoh had a son, God had a son. And in the book of Exodus, we see this great confrontation, not between Moses and Pharaoh, but between God and Pharaoh. In the love of God for his firstborn son, Israel. But in verse 2, we see the rebellion of young Israel. The more they were called, the more they went away. They kept sacrifice, sacrificing to the Baals and burning offerings to idols. Again, in verse 3, we see God's tender care for Israel. God taught them to walk, carry them, heal them, fed them. 
The image here is one of a father who is deeply involved. This is not simple, a simple kind of love. This is lo the love that is represented by a covenant. A love that cannot be broken or discarded. This is the very reason why there's so much tension in this book. God is committed to the covenant he has with Israel, to his promises. God is true to them. But Israel acts like a prodigal son who only takes but never gives. Look at verse 5. The consequence, they shall not return to the land of Egypt, but Assyria shall be their king because they have refused to return to me. A new exodus is coming, but this is a reverse exodus. Israel is heading back into slavery. Verse 6, God, verse six, God tells us that, that, that they will have no peace. Verse 7 says, my people are bent on, bent on turning away from me. And though they call out the Most High, he shall not raise them up at all. God is bent towards his people, but his people are bent towards sin. Sin is what causes God to turn his face from his people. What is the greatest problem we all have? What is the greatest issue that we all have as society? Some may say that we need better politics or that we need better education. Our problem is economical. Our problem is social. The Bible says otherwise. The problem is sin. Isaiah 59 verses 1 and 2 says this, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that he cannot save, or his ear dull that he cannot hear. In other words, God can do something. Right? God is all powerful. But, here's the problem. Your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God. And your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. Friends, just like Israel, by nature, we don't care about God. By nature, we will not seek him. But in spite of all this, listen to how God yearns for his people in verses 8 through 9. How can I give you up, O Ephraim? How can I hand you over, O Israel? How can you make you like Adma? How can I treat you like Zeboim? My heart recoils within me. My compassion grows warm and tender. I will not ex execute my burning anger. I will not again destroy Ephraim. For I am God and not a man, the Holy One in your midst, and I will not come in wrath. This is almost like God is changing his mind. This is almost God, like God is saying, I will punish you. No, I won't. I will discipline you. No, I won't. What is going on with God? Could he be changing his mind? Is God here regretting his earlier statements? No, friends. God does not change. God is displaying here through his emotions one of the greatest mysteries in the Bible. How can a just God forgive a sinful people? How can God uphold his justice and his love at the same time. God in his justice knows Israel deserves the wages of his sin. But in his love, in his covenantal love, he desires to save his people. Even when they are in deep rebellion. God 
loves the unlovable. And this should impact the way we live, shouldn't it? You know why God loves you? Because God loves the unlovable. In the sight of God, your sins have made such a separation between you and your God that you are unlovable. But there is more grace in God than there is sin in us. There is more grace in God than there is sin in us. So friends, we too are called to love the unlovable. Do you know the unlovable? Do you deal with the unlovable? Is the unlovable sitting right next to you? God calls us to love the unlovable. But how can God do this? There's an interesting feature in this passage that actually shed some light on this great mystery. On God displaying his love and justice. Look at the first verse again. Out of Israel, I'm sorry, out of Egypt, I called my son. In the Gospels, the Apostle Matthew actually cites this passage again in the context of Jesus' life. After Jesus was born, King Herod set out to kill Jesus. So his parents, Mary and Joseph, fled to Egypt. Once Herod died, Matthew says, this was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken through the prophets. Out of Egypt, I called my son. Wait a second, Matthew. We all know that Hosea was not referring to Jesus here. Matthew, this passage is not about Jesus. Did you not take how to interpret the Bible in seminary, Matthew? Do you not know the basic principles of interpreting the Bible? I think this is what Matthew would say, well... Is Jesus not the true Son of God? Is Jesus not the firstborn of all creation? Is Jesus not the true, faithful remnant of Israel? And then I think Matthew would take me to his citation and say, Did you notice that I quoted the first verse? Out of Egypt I called my son. Did you notice I did not quote verse 2? The more I called, the more they went away. You see, what Matthew is doing here is he is drawing a distinction between Jesus and Israel. Israel is the son of God who is unfaithful. Jesus is the son of God who is faithful. Jesus was faithful when Israel was unfaithful. When God called, Jesus answered. He always obeyed the Father perfectly. He was the only one to do so. Therefore, every promise made to Israel is actually given to Jesus. 2 Corinthians 1 verse 20 says this, For all the promises of God find their yes in Him. That is why it is through Him that we utter our amen to God for His glory. Where Israel failed to receive the promises of God, Jesus succeeded. You see, I'm actually giving you the key to interpret the Old Testament. Right? Uh, the Old Testament ought to be interpreted as uh, uh, with the goal of finding its fulfillment in Jesus. How are these promises given to Christ? Well, they're given to Christ because when all walked away, he was faithful. To what point? To the point of death. Even death 
on a cross. It's interesting when we see Jesus on Calvary, even his most faithful disciples walk away. They flee. They deny him. It's almost like the kingdom of God that had at a point been so large shrunk and shrunk and shrunk until none was found faithful but one. And as Jesus agonizes on the cross and as he dies, the kingdom of God is in one place only. On that cross on Calvary. And it only has one citizen. Christ himself. Only Christ is faithful. But the following question. But then you should be asking the following question. What about me? I thought I was part of the kingdom of God. How do I receive the promises of God? You see, this is why it's so important that Jesus was alone faithful Israel. Because everyone, you can fill this in, who is united with Christ by faith receives all the promises of God. Ephesians 1.3 says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ. As we are united with Christ, we are blessed with every. Not many, not most, every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Friends, we are only, we're only blessed. We're only saved. We're only renewed when we come to Christ by faith. This means the promises of the Bible are not about you. Do not read the Bible thinking that that book is about you. The promises of the Bible are about Christ. They're for him, and he is the one that receives them. But if, by faith, you make them about Christ, then they are yours as well. That's how we read the Bible. Where is Christ? How is this pointing to Christ? How are we seeing Christ in this passage? How do we see Christ in the narratives, in the Torah, in the poetry, in the Psalms, in the laments? Where do we see Christ? And that is how we relate to the Bible. Several years ago, my wife, Indy, was recognized for being the awesome teacher that she is. Well, she, she received an award, and, uh, and with that, she received a free, uh, an invitation to a, to a glamorous uh, dinner at a cruise. So, you know, she was able to bring one guest, so I went along. <laughs> when we, well, I'm, glad. I'm glad I was the one she chose, yeah. Um, when we got there, you know, they were checking the names on the list, Right? My name is all, our name is usually on top. Almeida is such a, you know, such a uh, alphabetically, you know, uh, high name. Uh, so we arrive, and, and one of the top names is Indira Almeida. Wow. She got this. You know, this is, this is her blessing. But right next to her name, there was a little note. You know what it said? It said plus one. <laughs> That's me. I'm plus one. Well, you know, at the end of the day, everything that Indy enjoyed, I would enjoyed. You see, I, I didn't come into that cruise because I was awesome. I came into that cruise because she's awesome. I came into the cruise because she accomplished something great. And because she loves me, she chose to share that blessing with me. Friends... In heaven, okay, we're going to be a bunch of plus ones, okay? Because, because the name that matters is the name of Christ. The blessings are His. Salvation is of Him. Heaven is for His glory. 
We come to heaven because we are with him. His is the name that is above every name. The name by which salvation has come. And the name under which there is salvation in no other name brings salvation. But the name of Christ. I told you earlier that the greatest problem we have is sin. And I asked the question, how can a just God forgive a sinful people? But I didn't give you the answer. But I want to give you the answer now. Christ not only gives us all of the blessings that belong to him. We're co-heir with Christ. But he also takes on himself our sin. You see, if Christ, if Christ simply if Christ simply forgave us our sins, we will be neutral, right, before God. So our sins are indeed imputed to Christ, right, given to him. But it doesn't stop there. His righteous deeds, his law-abiding character is granted to us. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says this. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin. So where is this sin coming from? It's your sin. It's my sin. It's our sin. Jesus became sin. So that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Where is this righteousness coming from? It's his. You see? Our sin to Christ. His righteousness to us. This is the great news of the gospel. I don't know if you know this message. Here is the message that we proclaim. Here is the message that saves us. Here is the message that sanctifies us. That God is good. That God created us to have a perfect relationship with him. But in our rebellion, we said no. I love myself more than I love you. But God in his relentless love pursues sinners. And he comes after us. And he says, I love you too much. So I give you my son. And it is by trusting in his son Trusting in his sacrifice on the cross. Trusting that he died for sinners, for sin. That we can come to God. And we're given a new life. Friend, do you know this message? How are you trying to relate to God? Are you here in church because you're trying to appease the wrath of the everlasting God? If I just show up at church a couple of times. But you have no law for God's people. Are you trying to relate to God by doing well in your job and being hardworking and all good things, right? But is that the basis? Is that what you're bringing before the Lord and saying, I know you will accept me because of the good that I have done. Is that what you're bringing to the Lord? Friends, in relationship with God will only be those who come with empty hands, who say, I have nothing to offer but my faith that your son died for me. Do you know this message? I, 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 I feel sometimes so concerned that some of you are sitting in these pews week after week and you're not getting this. I, I feel so concerned that some of you may have walked in today for the first time, and you're going to hear, hear this message and not understand that this is the heart of the Christian message. That we have nothing good to bring to God. So we approach Him with empty hands, saying, I trust your Son died and has forgiven me of my sins. So now... I can be in the presence of holy God. Do you know this message? Have you been to, coming to church for years, decades? Do you know this message? 
the message of reconciliation. I pray you do. I hope you do. In verses 10 through 12, we see God's mercy displayed to Israel as he intends to eventually bring, in, bring them out of the captivity that he has promised. We have considered the love of God, but now let's consider the justice of God. In verse 1, Ephraim is indicted for falsehood, violence, and seeking a covenant with Assyria. Chapter 12, verse 2, we see that Judah is indicted. And God promises to judge them according to their deeds. That is, that, that's what the Bible calls retributive justice. That means you get what you deserve. An eye for an eye. A tooth for a tooth. It all sounds very good until it's your eye. Until it's your tooth, Right? Retributive justice has a goal to keep us, to keep the unjust from practicing injustice. God wants Israel and Judah to be just, just as God is just. But retributive justice, you know, this idea that you get what you deserve, only stops the actions but does not change the heart. So God in verses 3 to 5 uses an example from the life of Jacob. Jacob was a trickster. From the womb, he came up, he came out holding on to his brother's heel. He tricked his older brother to exchange his right of inheritance for a bowl of lentil soup. Jacob lived as though God would never bring justice to him. But as an adult, Jacob learned to wrestle with God. He sought the Lord and did not let him go until he would bless him. And through Jacob, all of the nation of Israel was blessed. Look at halfway through verse 4. He met God at Bethel. And there God spoke to us. Jacob is the father of of the nation of Israel. As a matter of fact, his name was changed. And the first time the name of Israel comes in the Bible is when God changed the name of Jacob to Israel. Did you hear the plural? God, through Jacob, spoke to us. And Israel was blessed because of the faithfulness of Jacob. Jacob went from taking advantage of others to being a blessing to others. You see, J Jacob didn't just receive retributive justice. Jacob received a heart transformation. He was deeply changed. So, the conclusion in verse 6 is, So you, by the help of your God, as God works in your heart, as God calls you to faithfulness, return, hold fast to love and justice. And wait continually for your God. In other words, if Jacob could change, so can Israel. If someone like Jacob could change, so can Israel. And so can you. Listen to our covenant here at Sheridan Hills Baptist Church. Our covenant that we hold together as members. A section of our covenant says this. We also engage to be just in our dealings. Faithful in our engagements and exemplary in our attitudes and actually in actions. Recently, I was speaking with a young man in the life of the church, and, and he told me that there were things going on in his job that were not godly. You know what this young man did? He quit his job and got a different job. Is, isn't that what the, we're agreeing to, right? If it, if it takes quitting my job so I can honor my Lord and serve my church, I will do that. If, if, if it takes quitting my job to be just and faithful and exemplary, I will do that. Friends, we all have things that we cling to that are keeping us from being just and faithful. Look at the example of this young man. What are the things in your life that are keeping you 
from being just and faithful and good. Don't cling to it. Instead, put on the righteousness of Christ, Romans 13, 14. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. What are the things in your life that are driving you to live in the flesh? Those things must be put to death. Those things must be eliminated. And instead, we ought to put on Jesus Christ. That's a weird thing, right? Put on Jesus Christ? How do I do that? Well, we identify with Christ by faith. We come to him and we believe him. We come to him in faith. We never um, retire from doing good. I want to speak to the senior adults here with us today. Friends, are you growing in your relationship with the Lord? Are you growing in fair, fairness? Are you growing in your work ethnic, ethics? Are you, are you being transformed still by this putting on Jesus Christ? With love and respect, I want to challenge you, but also with a pastoral heart. Are you still growing in the Lord? Are you using your time wisely? To advance the kingdom of God. Gentlemen, which young man in this congregation can you point to as someone who you are discipling? Ladies, what about you? Are you discipling younger ladies? We never retire from doing good. We always seek to be faithful and just in our dealings. Galatians 6, 9 through 10 says this, And let us not grow weary, of doing good, for in due season we'll reap if we do not give up. That sounds like we'll reap the benefits at the end, right? So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the households of household of faith. We must always be ready to do good. Yet our primary responsibility is to do good towards those who are of the household of faith. That means the local church. That means Sheridan Hills Baptist Church. This is your place to do good. How is the ministry of the local church being impacted by you? What kinds of things would not get done if you weren't here? I often say that one of the greatest strengths of Sheridan Hills is community. We do community well, and we do community for the right reasons. Because we love Christ, therefore we love his bride. If we get something right, it is community. Yet there is still room to grow because the Lord hasn't returned. Are you engaged in the community life of this church? Friends, can I speak to you? It's, you know... 12 or 6, sometimes I see people leaving at 12. Can I tell you, if the service is not over and you don't have a reason to leave that is pressing, it's not loving to leave early. It's not loving to not stay and sing together and respond to the Lord. It is loving to stay and not just leave trying to beat the crowd. We don't have a crowd here. We have a congregation. We are a people redeemed by God. Don't leave early. Lunch can wait. Don't leave early unless you must, right? I want to recognize that there are some who must. Love the people of God by staying until we're done with the service. And when you're done, linger. Linger because we want to get to know you. We want to know who you are. We want to know how we can love you. We want to know how we can serve you. And we want to give you opportunities to love and serve. Back to the text in verse 7. Ephraim is described as a dishonest merchant. In verse 8, he thinks he is okay simply because he is wealthy. In verse 9, God tells Israel that the time of exile is coming back. Verses 10 through 14, we see the dependence that Israel once had in God and the humility 
of their origin. And this is contrasted with Israel and Israel's pride today. So, should God's justice be a reason for joy among us? Should we think, should we sing about the justice of God? Well, if you don't know Christ as your Savior, no, it's no reason to be joyful. But if you do know Christ, the justice of God is a blessing. Because, because through Christ, God causes his love to meet his justice. Listen to Romans 3, 21 through 26. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ. For all who believe, for there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Do you want justice? All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But almost in the same breath, Paul says, and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation. As someone who takes the sacrifice that should be yours. By his blood to be received. How? By faith. Not by works. By faith. This was to show God's righteousness. Because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. He was to show his righteousness at the present time. So that he might be just. And the justifier. Do you see justice and love meeting? Because Christ took on your sin, God is just because the sin was paid for. And because he took on your sin, he can justify you. The justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus Christ. So friends, when we sing of God's justice, let us sing with joy. Because God's justice met God's Love on the cross of Jesus Christ. Finally, let's consider the judgment of God. Israel was a great nation. He had a bright past. Psalm 48 says this. Zion is called the joy of the earth. The city of the great king. Verse 1 says, when Ephraim spoke, there was trembling. But in verse 2, we see that the sin of Israel multiplied. They sought idols instead of the one true God. They sought fertility and prosperity through Baal. They sacrificed their children to Moloch. Because of sin and idolatry, Ephraim went from being powerful to being pitiful. As we, as we were doing some spring cleaning before Boaz was, uh, it came a few months ago, I came across a bag that I had brought over when I immigrated from Brazil, and I found in that little bag medals. You know, at a point in my life, I, I, I want medals. You know that? Um, I, I looked at those medals. I won those medals in a swimming competition that, uh, I, that, I, that I participated on in eighth grade. And I looked at those medals, and I looked at myself, and I said, what happened? <laughs> what happened here? You see, uh, there was something that happened between that time in eighth grade and my time today. I, I don't have the same abilities anymore. I, I neglected the discipline of swimming. The same had happened to Israel. Israel neglected the Lord. Therefore, the glory of the past was no more. Verse 3 Therefore, they shall be like the morning mist or like the dew that goes early away, like the chaff that swirls from the threshing floor or like smoke from a window. Mist, dew, chaff, smoke, all things that are here today and gone tomorrow. The glory of Israel is gone. And why? Because of sin. The sin of Israel multiplied. Friends, let us not think of sin lightly. Do not be surprised. If you find no prosperity, no satisfaction in life, if you're embracing sin instead of fighting it. 
Verses 4 and 5, God again speaks of a father who loved Israel and brought him out of Egypt as the, as the Lord provided for Israel in the wilderness. Israel began to prosper. And, Israel pro and as Israel prospered, Israel forgot the Lord. Verse 6, but when they had grazed and become full, they were filled and their hearts was lifted up. Therefore, they forgot me. Have you ever asked something of the Lord and when you received it, forgot to give thanks? You know how you did that? Because you love the gift more than the gift giver. Friends, we're not very different from Israel. We must grow in our love towards God. Yet the Lord does not forget those who are his. Isaiah 49, 15. Can a woman forget her nursing child? That she should have no compassion on the son of her womb. Even these may forget, right? That's hard to think about, that to consider. But even that may happen. Yet I will not forget you. The Lord does not forget those who belong to him. Instead, he disciplines them. So in verse 7 through verse 14, he stands as an adversary of Israel. Verse 7 and 8, God compares himself to lions and leopards and bears. These are signs, you may fill this in, of judgment on the sin of Israel. It's like the Lord is saying, Israel, draw out your sword because we're going to fight. What an eerie sight. In verse 9, Israel stands against her helper. Verses 10 and 11, God asks Israel about their kings. In 1 Samuel, we're told that Israel had no need for a king, but because Israel wanted to be like the other nations, Israel asked for a king. And God gave them a king. And even God giving them a king was a sign of his judgment. Verses 12 through 13, the sin of Israel is being stored up and the Lord is keeping account of them all. But then we arrive at verse 14. And here we find perhaps the greatest promise in the book of Hosea. God has just promised judgment to Israel. This chapter is one of the darkest chapters in the book. But then he says, without preparation, without a, a transition, he says, I shall ransom them from the power of Sheol, the land of the dead. I shall redeem them from death. O death, where are your plagues? O Sheol, where your, is your sting? Compassion is hidden from my eyes. This is not merely a promise of delivery from slavery. This is a promise of delivery from death. A greater promise. I'm doing away with death. Death will die. Finally, hope. Finally, the judgment is over. Finally, God is for Israel. This would be a lovely ending. But there are two more verses here. Look at the following two verses. Though he may flourish among his brothers, the east wind... The wind of the Lord shall come rising from the wilderness, and his fountain shall dry up. His springs shall be parched. It shall strip the treasury of every precious thing. Samaria shall bear her guilt, because she has re re rebelled against her God. They shall fall by the sword. Their little ones shall be dashed in pieces, and their pregnant women ripped open. What happened with Death dying. What happened with hope? This would actually eventually happen as Israel would go into captivity by the Assyrians. But where does verse 14 fit in this whole deal here? How, how do we understand this? It was abrupt, wasn't it? What is it about? Well, the Apostle Paul actually quotes this verse in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 54, he says, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death 
is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, this was a promise that was stored up that could only be delivered by the Messiah. Chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians is about the resurrected Christ. Israel was waiting for one who would defeat death. So that these promises, so even though Israel would go to, go, go to, to exile and be enslaved once again, Israel didn't need to fear because there would come one who would deliver Israel from her great enemy, the sin that lives within. By the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, death dies and sin reigns no more. Jesus came and killed death. How? By dying. The death of Jesus was for the sin and all who trust in him. So since he died, we don't have to. We have eternal life. First Peter 2, 24. He himself bore our sin in his body on that tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds we have been healed. Here's my conclusion. You can feel this in. Those who belong to Christ can fully enjoy the love of God without fear of his judgment because Jesus has taken upon himself all of our sins. Do you believe that? Let's pray.